Hi, Scott Baker, editor-in-chief of The Blaze. And, you know, uh, we know that you like to read The uh, the Blaze. And the one thing that we know about, uh, especially the people that, are, you know, watch Glenn's uh, TV show or listen to him on the radio is um, uh, you people like to read a lot. You tend to buy a lot of books. And, and, uh, and, and, and you're not intimidated if Glenn's like, you know, this book is 800 pages and you need three master's degrees. You're like, okay, we'll buy that one too. So um, uh, as we've been featuring authors and, uh, and, and discussing some of these things on the, the Blaze over the last few months, um, you know, it's one thing when you hear an, an author comes on and they're like, oh, I've got this great book and you should buy it. Uh, but behind every great book is a great editor and behind a lot of these book publishing groups, they're thinking about like, wait, who are buying, who, what kinds of people are buying these books? So we have uh, a great editor here today and Adam Bellow with uh, HarperCollins and the imprint is called Broadside. Yes. And you're doing some very innovative things with um, with ebooks, and we're going to get to that. But but start with Broadside. How did Broadside begin? How did you get interested in working with edit with books and authors in this area of conservative writing? Well, I I've been a I've been a book editor in New York City for nearly 25 years. So you're, you're a communist. Uh, right? So I'm a yeah I'm a I'm a red diaper. <laughs> <lady>. <laughs> right, yeah. I grew up on the Upper West Side. Oh man. Uh, and uh, as far as I knew, I was a liberal. As, as far as you knew. As far as I right. knew. Well, how would you how would you know otherwise? Because right. you only you know you never talk to anybody who didn't share the same views. Right. Right. And it was the '60s and '70s. Right. And, you know, it just was sort of everything seemed very obvious. You know, the war in of Vietnam course, was right. wrong. Nixon was the Nixon was the devil. Uh, you know, there was no reason to question any of this. Right. It wasn't really until, for me, right. um, until the 1980s in the, in the Reagan years, mm -hmm. the thing that really um, pushed me to the right was the um, Iran-Contra okay. controversy. Right. It seemed to me um, just common sense that we didn't want to have a communist insurgency right. taking over Central America. Right. I mean, this seemed just sort of self-evident, right. you know. And who's yet, that good for? And who's that right. good? Why would we want that? And yet the Democratic Congress was passing all kinds of laws, you know, forbidding Ronald Reagan from coming to the aid of the of the right. the Contras, and it seemed to me very unserious. And so well, that's and that's interesting because the, the um, um, you know you hear sometimes from people um, that grew up in similar circumstances to yours that maybe the old line is you know uh, a conservative is, is a liberal who got mugged by reality and mm -hmm. they, they 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 grow up they start getting income they start looking at taxes and they're like wait a minute this isn't quite or or they, even they look and they say these welfare programs that I thought were helping people really aren't mm -hmm. so it's a little bit unique you don't hear often people say it was the Iran Contra thing that really turned me uh, into a conservative but did that start your uh, reconsidering the other pieces of that ideological well, puzzle. What, yeah, what happened was that I started talking to people right. about about the situ about the controversy, and I found that nobody was willing to discuss it. Hmm. Um, so it really wasn't. It was partly the politics and right. the, the question of what's the right thing to do in Central America. But even right. more importantly, it was the refusal of liberals, people who I had, you know, grown up thinking were very, you know, educated, intelligent, you know, the the right. the in, the intellectuals. They wouldn't you know, grapple with they it. They simply wouldn't discuss it. Right. You know, it was like it was not to be allowed. Uh, the other the other thing that was influential to me was on my in my education, I was very fortunate to encounter a great teacher uh, named Alan Bloom, mm -hmm. who right. is is dead now. Right. But Alan was uh, a professor of political philosophy at the University of Chicago. And uh, he was a friend of my right. father's, who right. my dad was the Saul Bellow, the novelist. Right. And uh, so I was exposed to Bloom very, right. you know, very early in a sort of a family setting. Uh, and Alan was a very radical Which make, figure. But you know, both of the things that you said there make a lot of yeah. us, you know, jealous to grow up around that kind of. Uh, uh, and uh, you should be jealous <laughs> because, and there's, because there's no substitute for these guys. Yeah. You know, there's people right. like people like that. Really, I mean, you know, you just uh, the proper attitude is just to sit quietly at their right. feet and Could, listen. Towering talent and intellect, and uh, really yeah. an unbelievable privilege just to listen to them have a conversation. Right. You know, right. uh, so Bloom wrote a book uh, called "The Closing of the American Mind," right. and um, I had been uh, briefly a student of his at the University of Chicago, and I read the book um, while he after he wrote it. And um, it seemed very sensible to me. It was just all the stuff that he'd been talking about in, in, in our classes. Uh, and then uh, time went by and it was published. And at that time I, was, I had moved back to New mm -hmm. York and I was a student at, in the history department at Columbia University. Right. 
and um, you know, again, and a big outcry about this book. And you know, I had read it, and I didn't recognize what, how it was being described and attacked by right. you know people in the press. And, and again, I tried to talk to people about it, and I found that nobody wanted to discuss the ideas in Alan Bloom's book. Right. They just wanted to, you know, to attack him, to demonize him, to call him an elitist, uh, you know, un-American, uh, you know, undemocratic. And it just, I just didn't like it. You know, right. I mean, I didn't. What I really, what I really reacted against most uh, strongly was this was the idea that you there were certain there were certain opinions and ideas that you weren't allowed to express. Right. And that just offended my, you know, my, I, that's what, I, that's not what I thought it meant to be liberal. I thought to be liberal meant to be open-minded and tolerant. More than anything. Right? right? Yeah. That was the, uh, that's how they, that's how it was sold. So yeah. that began, th that and a few, and some of what was going on politically at the same time, these things sort of moved me right. farther and farther to the right. And then I was very fortunate um, to land my first job in publishing at a, at a house called the Free Press. Right which was the, as it so happened, the place where conservative books were being published. Uh, the only place in New York where right. conservative books were being published. And conservative books began to sell. That's and, right. Uh, and to sell well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and often are dominant on, on many of, of the lists. It took publishers a little while to kind of get on to the Wait a minute. We might be able to make some money over oh, here. Oh, it took right? them longer than a little while. Oh, it did. Okay. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. There was what, great resistance. Was there a tipping point there? What was? The yeah, I would say. You know, the. Um, you know, I started in publishing in the late '80s, and uh, you know, we were doing uh, books by people like George Will, right. Francis Fukuyama. Um, you know, sort of the sort of very sort of high-end intellectual right. books. You know, the pe books by people who. Uh, who had some, you know, who were respected by right. the by the by the liberal media establishment. Right. They well, could go on Charlie Rose. They were allowed. Right. They right. were. Yeah. Um, but during the uh, what happened was that during the um, Clinton years, the publishing uh, world changed dramatically. Got a little feistier. Yeah, very feisty. And the right the right wing really sort of exploded. And this was also at this at the same time as the talk radio was expanding. Right. Um, uh, cable television was uh, was coming online. Um, uh, the internet was still in its infancy, but these these new media uh, right. functioned to create all of a sudden, all, all seemingly overnight, a mass market right. for conservative books. So and and yet in here in New York, the the most of the publishers <laughs> simply didn't want to hear about it. Right. You know, they just didn't want to deal. If we with just it. if we just pretend this isn't happening, yeah. it'll go away. Yeah. Right. And that's how and that's what they thought. Right. And you know, and we've come to a point where, and I think people are probably surprised when they you know read in Forbes or something that of all the things that Glenn does, you know, mm -hmm. the, the the book division is what's you know seems to be you know uh, most profitable a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Um, the uh, but you're doing something very new uh, here this week, uh, and uh, it's um, um, e-books, which we're familiar with now on, on readers, right. but 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 publishing books. Uh, a series of books. Uh, it, it almost is. It's kind of like forward thinking, and it has kind of that element of pamphleteering of, right. of, of old, all mixed into one. So this and this is Tea Party focused. This first series. Well, yeah. So you know, as just to in the in the broader sense, as I think everybody watches Glenn knows, right. um, uh, e-books are the new thing. Right. Uh, you know, uh, publishers are very anxious to to figure out how to make. Uh, make a successful business right. out of publishing ebooks. Now, most of ebooks uh, are really just the digital uh, form of an existing printed book. Right. And that printed book, which exists in the stores, right. sort of serves as the marketing platform right. for the ebook. That's how people hear about it. I'm, the, I'm like the ideal uh, publisher customer because I like the actual book, mm -hmm. but then I often will buy the ebook. Oh really? You know, two. So I, it's like, oh, I want to see this one, but then I also, oh, I'm getting on a plane, so yeah. I don't want to carry this thing. So right. the, uh, so you do both, but. Um, but, that, but, that, I, but that's interesting. I mean, I'm always interested to hear right. to learn about people's, you know, buying and reading patterns. Yeah. It seems a little unusual for people to do that. Oh, it's even weirder because I, I like my Kindle sometimes, uh -huh. but I, I sometimes I'll only have room to carry my iPad. So sometimes I'll have three different versions of it. Well, you're just too wired. <laughs> yeah, it's sick, yeah. Right. You're, a, you're obviously ahead of the curve. And uh, so, but these are gonna be ones that are, are, are only a, Available as eBooks. Well, which so yes. Yeah, so the idea now is to is to figure out how to how to be you know how do we publish original eBooks right. books eBooks that simply exist in the digital space. Right. Um, now I'm uh, a I'm a lifelong conservative 
editor. I've been doing this for a long time, and HarperCollins is one of the one of the few major New York publishers that has not created uh, a, a dedicated imprint for right. conservative books. So it was decided sometime after the I was, for example, I was uh, Sarah Palin's editor for right. Going right. Rogue, and I think that could have, you know, uh, spurred changed right. the it's yeah. changed the calculus at, at right. HarperCollins, and the and it was understood that so you were you were publishing conservative authors. Right. In, in hardcover. In hardcover, but more on a case-by-case -case basis rather than as an, as an imprint, per se. Yeah, that's right, because, um, uh, you know, there, so in some cases, uh, there's a, it's, it's thought that there should be a dedicated imprint. In other houses, they right. like to mix them into the, to the, general, to the general program, sure. which is, you know, what, what in my last job, which was at Doubleday Random House, uh, that was the method. Right, uh, right. And I was able to do a certain amount of, you know, of... of uh, a, you know, guerrilla conservative publishing. For example, Jonah Goldberg's book, Liberal Fascism, right. was one very of mine. Very influential book yeah. and very important book to Glenn. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so w for, for the person that, uh, you know, said, all right, I've got a Kindle and I'm interested in, in the Tea Party, what kind of, what are the things that are going to be available to them? Well, so our, de so our decision I'm is... I'm getting ahead of you. I guess yeah, no, that's okay. I want the setup too here because it's fascinating. Well, you know, you get me started and it's, right, hard, right. For me to, it's hard for me to contain my sure. enthusiasm. Um, our, our plan is to launch our, our program of original digital, public, di digital books, uh, e you know, original EPUBs, mm -hmm. uh, with a digital pamphlet series. Uh, and the uh, focus is uh, Tea Party activists. Right. So the series has a title. It's called Voices of the Tea Party, and we have uh, asked one of our one of our book authors, Michael Patrick Leahy, who is a Tea Party organizer, right. to act as, in the role of series editor. So it is to be Mike's finding role. Finding the voices. That's right. Because right. I don't because I don't know all right. all the people in the Tea Party. Right. So um, so we have a we have a Tea Party member who has. Uh, helped us to, uh, you know, uh, identify and uh, uh, and commission works from potential authors, activists, and real, you know, real right. people, real Americans, non-professional writers, people who these are not, you know, these are not uh, people who appear on, right. uh, who who are published in uh, uh, existing uh, outlets. They they're but not may people, ha but they may have things to say. They very much, de they very much right. so have. They very definitely have things to say. Yeah. Right. And 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 for a publisher, then. The, the 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 risk is lowered for yours like for you we, right. it's like well, let's we can put a number of different voices out there without having to devote a whole lot of of paper and 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 physical effort to getting that that out there mm -hmm. and then who knows you may, you may find some star writers in there right well that's that's the that's the hope and the expectation right. i mean you know i i proceeded on the assumption that the that people in the tea party were actually you know intelligent literate Right. Could, uh, capable of stringing thoughts and ideas together. Wait, wait uh, a minute, what? what? Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I know it sound strange. I think you just violated, so there, I think that's again, <laughs> it's the law in Manhattan to say that. You yeah. know, I mean, I, I, I thought this is a, this is a movement of, uh, uh, of, of people who are, it seemed to me, right. it was clear, that it was a movement of people who were uh, very serious about uh, a return to constitutional governance. Right. Um, the, the this is a this was a, a group of people who who really felt that as as a country as a society we have moved far, too far away from the from the intent of the founders and they were very serious about bringing the country back in that in that direction. And so when Glenn says um, do your homework, mm -hmm. sometimes that's you know going to you know an event, sometimes that's picking up an eight hundred page book. Mm -hmm. But uh, there are some some sections of wisdom here that sometimes that you might say, you know what, I'm gonna, I need to read more than just a blog on this. Mm -hmm. I need to read a little more than just a magazine article. So this can kind of take you uh, deeper in some of the areas that matter. Well, let's be let's be specific. So okay. we've so uh, I, I've commissioned uh, so far about a dozen. Right. Um, uh, contributions from Tea Party members. We're, tomorrow we're publishing the first three. Uh, there is, uh, uh, and they're I think a very good representative sample okay. of this, the kind of thing that we'll be publishing in the series. So some of the some of the material is personal. You know, how did you you know how did you join the Tea Party? What is your what's your right. story? Some of it is uh, is practical. What are what are the lessons that you've learned from being a Tea Party organizer that that could be helpful and useful to other organizers in the movement? Right. Um, some of it is has to do with policy, right. um, and so one of our pamphlets is by a, uh, a medical doctor in Kansas, Milton Wolf, right, right. who 
you know, by some uh, very uh, amusing coincidence, is President Obama's second cousin. Yes, they, they're, exactly. They're blood relatives. Yeah. Their mothers were first cousins. Grew up together in, right. in Kansas. And he's a fa and I've interviewed him he, uh, on uh, on the Vcast show, and he's you know lively, fascinating, interesting. Oh, he's a brilliant guy. Uh, yeah, but Mike, in another circumstance, might not have been commissioned to write to to write a book, but yet you'd say right. this guy has something to say. Um, the um, so. How do you, how do you, what's the, the marketing challenge here? Uh, I mean, obviously you're sitting here talking t to me, but it's like, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to go into Barnes and Noble and, and see that on, right. on the shelves. Right. How are you going to connect, uh, you know, these eBooks to the, 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 the potential reader? Well, the primary audience for, for, for the voices of the Tea Party series is Tea Party it's members. Tea Party members, right. Because this is really, I mean, the thing that is, that I, that I want to get across that hasn't yet come through in our conversation is that we're really, this is really a, uh, a publishing platform that we're basically turning over to, to the Tea Party. We're, we're, right. This is kind of a unique thing. We're saying to, we're a major, you know, New York publisher, and we're saying to this, to this very diverse right. net network of people, here, take this over, use it, you, you steer, you drive, right. you tell us what to publish. Wow, that sounds radically dangerous. It does sound a little dangerous, <laughs> and I'm a little worried about what, what's going to happen. The, but that, but do you feel a little bit? I mean, it's. it's um, uh, I, I'm sure that in the in the history of publishing, um, you know, we look at, at you look at a development like the Kindle or the iPad, and you think this can destabilize things. I mean, there's all kinds of things mm -hmm. that would destabilize. Mm -hmm. But with the potential for destabilization, is also opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has to feel. You know, I'm not saying you have to feel like Gutenberg here, but it kind of has to feel a little bit exciting. Like maybe we are doing something uh, that's. Uh, oh, know, it's tremendously series. exciting. I mean, yeah. this is this is the. This is the most fun I've had in 25 years as an editor, <laughs> right. uh, because I'm getting to reinvent, you know, uh, 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 publishing in my area. Right. You right. know, the the thing that allows me to do what I'm doing uh, is there's a convergence of uh, tech of uh, technological change, uh, political uh, passion and intensity, right. uh, and a uh, and a and a sort of a um, a change in. Uh, people's reading habits right. uh, and a desire for, I think, for more um, uh, clearly for, right. for substantive but short, inexpensive uh, uh, reading material that uh, that focuses directly on the on the concerns of a very specific community of people. Right. The thing that al that enables me to to do what I'm doing is that I is that I publish into a very well defined. You know, niche the conservative the conservative right. community, which over the years that I've been working as an editor has developed an extremely intense uh, and highly you know uh, uh, ramified network of uh, you know uh, radio shows, websites, right. print and uh, internet publications. Why um, why hasn't this worked on the left? Uh, you know, I've, I've asked this question. That's a wonderful question, right? You know, it's like <laughs> why is there no really successful series of left yeah. radio talk shows? Yeah. You know, I mean, there, you know, you'll see books pop up that are on on the left that um, you know that make fun of Rush Limbaugh or, yeah. or whatever. But yeah. but the but the but the level of success, yeah. um, you know, doesn't seem to be there. What what have they not figured out? Well, it's very, it's a very interesting question. I mean, we understand, for example, we already know that um, Air America, right. uh, a left wing, uh, right. uh, you know, uh, radio network, failed because. It wasn't necessary. <laughs> I mean, I mean, one of the right, one of the facts of life is right. that NPR, uh, which is you know, <laughs> exists, which exists, yes, right. uh, you know, kind of makes that unnecessary. Yeah. You know, so um, uh, it's publicly publicly subsidized, and there's really no reason why anybody would listen, would need to, to, to hear anything more radical than that. Right. Um, uh, also, in the in the context of book publishing, traditionally, it was very difficult. For for uh, for people for liberals and leftists in publishing to imitate the success of the conservative uh, book market that that changed a bit in the Bush years, right? Um, uh, because it's because they did come on a little bit. It, yeah. it worked for them then because they because the left was very very angry, right? Uh, and outraged and in, incredulous. You know how could this how could this you know m monkey in a in a flight suit uh, you know be president, right? And so it was. So it was possible to publish that kind of that kind of best-selling book. Now, in the pamphlet area, you know, the left has always has always published pamphlets, but they have never really been 
uh, you know, a mass market thing. Again, right. it's it's preaching to the choir, right, right. you know, and you know, and the, but basically the people who publish those kinds of things um, uh, are relying on brand name authors like Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn, who give them you know right. uh, uh, outtakes from their books, which they put into pamphlet form. But it's not it's not a living culture. Right. It's not alive. So for the the. Um, for a Tea Party member, a conservative, uh, you know, looking to say, all right, well, you know, I might be interested in this, or I want to read uh, Dr. Wolf's uh, mm -hmm. book. So what's the, what's the cost level what's the, uh, you know, versus buying a regular book? Well, these are, these are, uh, pam these are digital essays uh, ranging from about five to 8,000 words, and they are an excellent value at $2 each. $2? $2. $2. Right. Yeah. So you're about to go on a trip, you're going to go on a plane, and mm -hmm. it's like, it, click, download, and it's there, and seconds and, uh, and now right. you've got something that, that you'll end the flight wiser, <laughs> right? Well, we like to think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, you know, the people who, who are the, our contributors are, uh, are, you know, if nothing, if not modest people. Right, you know, right. These are, these are people who didn't, you know, really didn't expect to be asked to write anything, who didn't think, you know, initially that they, that, that, that what they did, what they, you know, what they did at the revolution was of interest to anybody. But it turns out there's, you know, that for example, um, uh, one of our contributors, Mark Lloyd, is, an, is a, is a uh, Tea Party organizer mm -hmm. in Virginia. Um, he uh, happens to be, uh, by family a legend, a descendant of Patrick Henry. Uh, and he lives in the 5th Virginia District, which is where Patrick Henry lived. Right. And he tells a, a fast, what I think is a fascinating story. You know, one of the things that, that I want this series to do right. is, to, uh, is to tell some of the stories of what happened at the local district level right, right. in November 2010. Because there was a lot of exciting and dramatic things that happened. In the 5th District, um, there was a, this is the story of the primary uh, battle in, within the Republican Party and the struggle between the establishment GOP right. and, the, and the numerous Tea Party organizations that sprang up all right, over yeah. the state and that, were, and that disagreed with each other about everything and had, you know, that had, there were a lot of you know, headaches and, and Well, challenges. the beginning of anything interesting is going to have some turbulence there. And, yeah. it, it, and, and in a way, that it does make sense. I, I thought that the, that the test of a movement mm -hmm. is that next phase of, of maturation. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems to me that the existence of this series of, of e-books is showing that this movement is maturing. Well, you know, there's a, <clears throat> there is a gap in the publishing ecology right. between the blog post level right. and the book. Right, right. Uh, and certainly for people in the Tea Party, I think there's, although of course people, you know, they, they're very serious readers. Right. You know, they, uh, for example, I've become friendly with, um, with a, with a uh, libertarian law professor named Randy Barnett, uh, who wrote a book called The Lost Constitution. Hmm. Uh, it's a very serious scholarly book, and I was talking to him about, you know, about writing a book for for Harper Collins, and he said, you know, I hear most of the people I hear from are Tea Party people. How about that? Uh, and he said, you know, this is a, this is a very challenging book, but they they really they've really been wow. studying it, you know. So I mean, I'm very impressed by that. Well, real, real quickly before we wrap up, you also have plans down the road. I think you, beyond the Tea Party, you're looking at uh, at, at Hollywood. Well, we, yes, this, this model, which right. is intended to, to um, showcase the voices of individual conservatives right. who are out in the country, kind of below the radar, people who are not, they're not the people you see on Fox, right. they're not the people you read in the Washington Times or who write columns for Town Hall, but they, nevertheless, they have, they have something to say. Maybe not right, a whole right. book, you know, but they definitely have a contribution. So uh, we are launching our, our digital program with Voices of the Tea Party. And in the fall, we will launch a second series called Voices of the Hollywood Right, um, which again, again, we will have a there, series wait, editor. Is, they're they're uh, breaking news. There, there is a Hollywood Right. I know. Well, this is this is part of the news. You know, most people think they think Hollywood Right. They think, well, you know, Tom Selleck, Kelsey Grammer, you know, Charlton Heston. They, what people don't realize is that there are a lot more conservatives in Hollywood than than people think, mm -hmm. and all over the entertainment industry at every level. So we'll be we'll be publishing people, very interesting people who you have not heard of necessarily, but who have stories to tell. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Annabella, thanks for joining us. Thank and you very much. And ch check out uh, check out the ebook. So uh, where can they, is there a, is there a website where they can go to get information? There is there is indeed www.broadsidebooks.net. Broadsidebooks.net. That is our website. 
Thanks. just launched. Thank you very much.